Welcome to the next episode of Terrellon Talks. Today we have our very own Freddie and Julian on today. And basically we're going to start off with a bit of a follow-up on our last episode, as I know it was a bit of a different episode. Um, so we're kind of going to, you know, wrap that one up, um, go over kind of why we why we chose to do an episode like that, um, explain a bit more about what it was for those of you that um, either watched it, didn't watch it, maybe only watched part of it. Um, we will... Yeah, go over that a bit and then go into how we're also using AI here at Terlon. Um, and kind of how that is shaping up for the future of video production. I guess we'll just start with um, last episode, was episode 21, was a bit on AI. And that intention behind that entire episode was to produce something 100% by a various amount of AI tools. Um, so every part of that episode was completely constructed by AI from beginning to end. Um, everything except for me physically throwing the episode together in Premiere. So you um, edited it yourself? I did edit it yeah. myself. I know people have probably seen that like viral <laughs> video going around. Where you like press the button and it chops everything up. But no, I didn't actually use that. Um, but everything else was. So from the guest was just a standard AI like chatbot. Um, you know, similar to like an Alexa, um, standard voice there. But then my actual voice was a AI voice copy, they call it. So I recorded a basically a sample track, sent it in, and it created a copy of my voice, which I could then just do like speech or well, text to speech, text to speech. Mm, yeah. using my voice as the speech profile. How much do they need? Uh, track. So up to like 60 minutes, actually. Yeah, okay. send 60 minutes. No, you don't have to send. So you can record different companies are different, but some have this like set like three minute thing that you can like blur about for them. Mm -hmm. They'll create a base mm -hmm. off of that, which captures most of your voice patterns. Um, but obviously the more, the more, you send, the more, the more various stuff yeah. you can give you. So, um, so I sent in just a copy of an episode of mm -hmm. Talks of just my, my voice in it plenty um so just cut clips from that so just to summarize last episode you wrote the script or you asked ai to write the script for you yeah and then so you use a, a, a text-to-speech voice synthesizer to create the audio files based off of audio files of your actual voice yes that you, that exactly. you fed it and that was pretty smart it took um i mean it sounds it sounds very, very <laughs> so close. To, it sounds like a very sleepy Perry, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, you have a you have a, a very, uh, let's say, calm, relaxing voice anyway. So it did a good job with that. But I think it was just extra sleepy. Uh, so it's extra a bit like, um, so I was able to get like the outline and spit out a whole episode outline on AI from ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. um, and should preface that um, all of the tools we used, I used like the free version, except for a little bit for the voice copy. If I had paid, the episode would have cost like a couple hundred pounds to make for everything in total. Um, and obviously would have been of yeah. more like accurate production, if that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would have been able to do a more accurate voice copy for both guests and the script would have been less repetitive <laughs> yeah. if that makes sense so yeah jack gpt gave me the the outline and like the main points and then i used bard to give a more up-to-date version on how ai actually is right now and google bards um connected to the internet so it has live information yeah um which just gives you more is it better than more chat GPT? Than yeah. i wouldn't necessarily say it's better i think it's just they take different approaches to mm. how they accumulate and spit back information for you so it's interesting because like even if you um even just in, in in creating the script you didn't just passively ask an ai to make something there was a bit of back and forth between you and the various you know there was there was human input as well as as uh, our, the ai input 100 percent. yeah i wasn't like i didn't just hop on chat yeah. and be like make me a podcast and it yeah. just spit this out so there's a bit um, of tweaking from your end as well 
let, I mean, we'll get into the to the uh, um, to the text to voice part in a bit, but just talking about the the script um, or the, the the text generation part. Um, you, even that, there was a bit of back and forth between you. There was a bit of a bit of your input, which a lot of, and we'll also talk about how we use AI. But um, a lot of what people say, and even the scripts that for the podcast was saying that AI is used as a tool to uh, th that humans can use to create something. And that's very much what happened here, right? I would say it, it's the best kind of um, example is just, it's more of like a tool to get you started with a framework mm -hmm. that makes sense. So yeah. it will, um, I guess the way I actually go about things, I, we'll go and ask chat GPT or Bard a question and I, or more like a prompt, be like, I want you to write me an email. I want you to write mm. me a podcast episode or like get me an outline for a podcast episode. But I'm like, but first ask me a series of like 20 questions yeah. to help you better understand my point of view mm -hmm. or my, where I'm like coming from so that it can write a better response. And that's where my back and forth comes from from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it will then ask me a series of 20 questions being like, what's your podcast name? What's your target audience? What's, you know, an average episode? Like what, what's your tone of voice? Um, all these sorts of different things. And once it has all of that input, it will then be like, okay, thank you for that information. Here's mm. an episode outline that best fits what you've given me as an input. That's um, a very insightful tip i guess because you know most i i think most people just log on to like chat gpt and say you know write a podcast episode for me and don't really consider the fact that i mean they treat it like a google search right where you type in one thing and it spits out the results and if you then go back to the search bar and type in another thing then it'll give you a different set of results whereas with these ai models it's a bit more interactive and conversational where you can say I want to write, um, I want to write something, but here is some, uh, here are some bits of information that you should know before you start and feel free to ask me more questions. Um, yeah, and once you get your head around that, that's where AI will really, uh, differ from just, you know, starting your projects by just using a few Google searches or whatever. Yeah. And it's not just doing it for you because you obviously have to know how to ask the right questions. You have to know mm -hmm. how to get it to do what you want it to do. Yeah. And not just anyone can go on and just be like, write me this, do that. Mm -hmm. But it's going to spit out a relatively the same answer yeah. for everyone else. So if you, everyone's going to end up having the same email template, everyone's going to end up, if you only asked it to write you a podcast episode mm -hmm. on this, like it's going to give you the same template yeah. for everyone else who asked the same question as well. So you've got to figure out how to make it. You needed to unique. give it a few more variables before it starts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's great at getting the starting yeah. point and it gets you like, you know, it cuts <coughs> out 70, 80% of the, that busy work. But then it's down to you once you've got that framework. Like, okay. Now the like actual creativity and yeah. tweaking can come in. And the, and it's, this is, a, it's a new kind of technology. Do you call it technology or software? I guess it's a mix of both, but it's a new thing. And certainly when I started it, started using it, my, uh, my interactions with it or my, um, searches, I don't know what you call it. My queries, uh, <laughs> were very simple and they were, you know, they were like, do this for me, do this for me, do this for me. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. It made it. Um, but as soon as, once you start using it a little bit more and you, um, start to become quote unquote power user and you know that you can ask it to ask you questions, uh, clarifications, ask you for more details, ask you for more variables, um, and treat it more like a conversational thing rather than just a simple search bot, um, then that's when you can really leverage uh, it, its full potential. And a lot, there's a lot of buzz going around as like, oh, AI can completely do this for you and AI can completely do this for you and like, and it's going to take over and, and it's going to replace humans. And I like, that's not 
the case, at least not yet. Um, I don't think we're even close to the case. (laughs) You you really need to interact with it to use it properly. I guess it makes sense because it's a a learning algorithm. And so if you get it to learn about you, then you can tailor it uh, a bit better. It's very clever to think about, you know, having the AI learn about you before kind of just asking it, you know, can you write a script for me or can you do this? And kind of getting it to ask you the questions. Um, yeah, I found that's where I've noticed the biggest difference as well between the different, mm. I guess, you can't call it a search engine because it's not just that, but between the difference between like ChatGPT and Bard and all the other ones out there, is when one is connected to the internet, like Bard knows about Terralon, whereas ChatGPT does not. Yeah, because ChatGPT is 2020, isn't it? it yeah, but it also just doesn't really pull like that kind of information. Yeah. Um, so I can like tell Bard something that I want to do so that's, that was recent, but already kind of knows the gist mm. of what Terralon does. So it will pull like our taglines and things like that and work that into copy, stuff like that, that ChatGPT wouldn't do. Is it because well, it has more user data? To work with Bard than ChatGPT as well. Probably, so I mean, it's Google, so <laughs> <laughs> I assume they have all the information they would ever need. But with ChatGPT, even I mean, you can get around that, and it's what we were just saying just right like now. Is like, yeah, you, mm-hmm. you can That's start important. by saying, "All right, I'm gonna want to say you want to write um, a motivational speech for the, the Terralon team," um, <laughs> which I did earlier today. Um, I started by saying, you know, Terralon is this, its team members are Guy, Perry, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have just done these various things and events. And um, next thing that we're doing is going to be this, this, and this. Um, and using all of this information, write me a motivational, motivational speech. You don't just say... I need a motivational speech for Terralon's team because otherwise mm-hmm. it's like, I don't even know who Terralon is. Right. Yeah. Um, and what do you want to be motivated about? Um, I mean, and, and you can just start with write me a motivational speech and then it'll write you something bleh. And yeah. then you say, okay, rewrite this, but include this following information and make it more epic or make it more this mm-hmm. and make it shorter and whatever. Um, it's kind of like a, like a resume, like, or CV, you want to give it bullet points mm-hmm. that are concise yeah. and get exactly the point across that you want to and kind of <clears throat> capture, I kind of say like capture the essence of yeah. the topic that you have behind yeah. like the intention of what you want mm. to write. And then once you have that as well, uh, I mean, because you can do everything in chat GPT and then just copy and paste the result. But what I tend to do is uh, I then take that and then paste it into a Word document and then tweak it manually myself because oh, it, cause, mm. I mean, e- even if you interact with it a lot, every single result you'll get will, uh, will feel a little bit synthetic. So if you, and using it over and over, you can like, even we, like we could pick out that you've mm. written it on chat GPT today wow. right? yeah. <laughs> in pieces in, like, yeah, because in the more like I use chat GPT every day. So the more you use it, the more you can kind of pick out its tendencies because it has limitations. Yeah. Like it's not perfect. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a human yet. I've been using it for emails a lot. Yeah. And I mean, then, it's a great tool. Yeah. So if you're, I, if you're listening to this and you're one of our clients, <laughs> and I wonder if Freddie, you now know uh, why his uh, g- grammar <laughs> and, uh, and everything else has improved. Well, I sent a, an email the other day, not this was a personal email, but it came out with like a very, cause I asked it to, to write an email and it was very formal. So I asked it, asked the chat GPT, if you could do it less formal. And I, it was talking about, um, uh, it was something to do at my flat. And, but the way it wrote it was just really not like even Carolina who doesn't use chat GPT that much said like you didn't write this because <laughs> it yeah, just came like, out you know you ask it to be less formal you ask yeah. it to be cool and then it's like one of your parents trying to be down with yeah. the kids and yeah. it's like nah it's like you're asking a machine to <laughs> yeah. interpret what's cool and what's yeah. formal and what's not when it comes down to it it's still like a personal human opinion yeah and that changes from person to person yeah so, yeah I've always said it's a great tool it gets you 
that framework, especially if you're like mm-hmm. personally just not very good at that kind of thing, mm-hmm. it's really good at getting you started. And then some people just need that to be like, okay, this is a great baseline. And now I, you take it into a Google document, anything like that, Apple Notes, whatever, and then you humanize it, like mm-hmm. finish that last 20%, put your stamp on it, it's make like it a- personal. But you've already got the framework of what it should roughly flow like. And mm-hmm. then you can turn it into like a human conversation. It's almost like a mood board exactly. or a, a brainstorm a tool. A mood board for words. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> so what about, uh, what about the speech synthesis part? Like, I mean, like, it, talking about text is one thing, but. Yeah, I thought it, it was really it cool. Um, it was quite, probably the most fascinating part of it for me. Because uh-huh. I had never really messed with that stuff before. Honestly, it was really expensive, so I didn't buy the full thing. I spent like mm-hmm. 30 pounds rather than mm-hmm. like 100 pounds a month on it. Yeah. Um, because unlike the full thing, you can, it's very accurate. It gets your average tone of voice quite yeah, right. Yeah, and that's what it did. Like you yeah. asked it to get and your average Yeah, and if I had uploaded voice. and spent more time on the actual like submission for them to make a copy from, mm-hmm. it could have been almost identical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then the pain for like the more advanced versions, you can then go in and once you've typed, it is pretty accurate. It gets, you know, 80, 90% there, but you can go in like per syllable and change the intonation yeah. and tones on anything. So Or per sentence or per paragraph. Or ex- yeah. Exactly. Because um, if you do it syllable by syllable, you're probably... Yeah, it's more of the like a, when a, a, a word like trails off at the end of a sentence or something's yeah. like an exclamation point or something, like you can change that specific tone in there to like go up or go down. Yeah. Um, so, so it sounds as natural as you want yeah <laughs> <laughs> or you can give yourself an accent that's that kind cool. of thing yeah. um, so that's all really really cool mm. um, but just it takes time yeah I wonder what it would have been like if we had paid for the whole thing I mean it was cool as it was but it sounded like it, it was 17 minutes right the podcast yeah. roughly and I mean first uh, going back to the script and what was generated there first of all that was somewhat repetitive um, because it hit the same topics and kind of paraphrased them each time, mm-hmm. broadly speaking. Um, but then also, um, like the voice was, it it still sounded quite synthetic, even though it was very good. I mean, it's like a, a very close robot version of yeah. Harry. <laughs> um, but it still sounded somewhat unnatural. And listening to that for 17 minutes, mm. And if the content was a little repetitive because of, because it just hit the same topics over and over again, I think probably that could have been, you know, that, that should have been a five minute, a five minute thing followed by, <laughs> cause I mean, it's our podcast and I was like struggling to get through <laughs> it. So if, yeah, if the first podcast episode mm-hmm. you listened to was, the, was the last one, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's not, <laughs> not represented. Not yeah, duly noted. It's special episode. Yeah. But I, also a bit of the point because yeah, exactly. I kind of wanted to show that even mm-hmm. when something's 100% AI now, like we are nowhere near stuff yeah. being yeah. human. Like AI is a mm-hmm. very loose term mm-hmm. used these days, thrown around everywhere. Everything that's considered AI is honestly it's just not it's artificial <laughs> intelligence. Yeah. It is just algorithms and search engines that are just packaged mm-hmm. up. And yeah. they're fantastic, like they're better technology than we've ever had, mm-hmm. but it is not artificial intelligence. Yeah, like it's, I mean, it's turned into such a buzzword. Um, it's almost synonymous like, with technology. For just any new technology is yeah. AI. It's, yeah, like yeah. Photoshop's. It's a sellable uh, word at the moment. Mm-hmm. Photoshop's AI, what is it called? Generative fill? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's basically the same thing as, as, or basically but it's it's very close to what uh content Content aware aware fill was and they didn't call content aware fill ai Mm -hmm. so what's the difference like where where's the line different algorithm it's just i Mm -hmm. guess different algorithm but i think it's more of a marketing Uh, marketing term these days for a lot of things Mm -hmm. um (laughs) but uh yeah yeah i guess our intention there was just kind of wrap up what our last episode was like um just note that Every episode is not like that. That is the only episode we've ever done like that. Not sure we'll do one any uh, anytime soon. Maybe and, it might be cool to do I an mean, update. Yeah, maybe maybe in like another year when AI yeah. has advanced a little bit more. Um, 
or if we really want to splash out on a <laughs> on the budget for a, for a, and then mm-hmm. really go for it. But it was definitely just just an experiment to kind of see what we could do with mostly free tools out there in AI and get as far as we could with that. Um, but also really just highlight the challenges that are still out there and mm. that I don't think we're uh, in any danger of losing our jobs to AI anytime soon. I'm worried. Why are you worried? <laughs> what are you worried about, Freddie? Well, if, if people can, you know, uh, if AI gets to the point where uh, you can train AI to create an emotional sequence in editing, then we're not needed anymore. I think people will still value um, the human touch, but for a lot of companies, they, you know, who want to make a, a small video, they would come to us and it's easy to make. You know, it's not too difficult. You could easily ask an AI to do that. So that's what I would worry about. Yeah, but you'd still need like AI. Where's the idea come from? Still, like, yeah. you still got to come up with that. Because like you can, there are things like the GoPro app. You can mm. it, you can have it auto generate and edit for you, but it's a bit shit. And like, yeah, it will improve, um, but but you as soon as you want to like customize it, mm. and um, and our clients, you know, you, you you're best position to know that our clients want a lot of customizations mm-hmm. when it comes to editing. Like they always have like tweaks and stuff like that. Like as soon as you want to customize it and as soon as you want to tweak it, then you have to start using the little, the various tools within the software. Mm. So if you've got this like AI editing software, Mm. you need to learn how to use that software. Or like you, you can just do it automatically. You can feed it into it, press, press the edit button. Um, But then if you want to customize it in any way, you then have to tweak it in, I don't know, in a certain way which will require you to to start messing around with the software. And that's where like I think a lot of people will be like, nah, I don't have time for this. I don't have time to learn this software. Let's go and talk to Freddie, who is hmm. the editing wizard and knows how to use the latest version of Premiere Pro, which is now basically an AI editing software with some manual controls. Hmm. But what if it gets to the point where it, it makes it so easy for the user to just make those changes where you don't have to necessarily learn the software? I'm, just, just I'm not it. sure it will ever reach that far. It's like, hmm. if anything, it's going to make people be better editors. Hmm. The ones that aren't very good are going to are the yeah. ones that should probably have to Well, work. then they'll steal jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not good editors. And they're going to have to find something else. I think <laughs> the, the lower end of the tier is going to struggle mm. because that kind of work will become busy work mm. that can just way more efficiently be done. So if AI can essentially do 70% of your job, you can just output more high quality work. Mm. And that's what people will probably start to expect. Like you will no longer need to like, oh, I don't necessarily need to sort through all these clips for the best stuff because mm. AI can efficiently pick it out for me. Or I don't need to populate the timeline because AI can do that and gets all the way to the point where I now just need to put final touches on it mm. and create it, like package it up into this pretty piece of work where but AI cut out the busy work for you and saved you 70% of your time. Yeah, it would be nice to have a kind of AI software that could group shots in in terms of like um, uh, like you give it like people smiling and it groups like a bunch of shots of people smiling or different categories of shots. That'd be a huge time saver. Um, but what, from what I gathered, you guys don't seem worried. I'm the only one who worries. <laughs> 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 you are, I think we're just currently at a spot where all it is is complimentary. It's not. Yeah, it's not taking over anyone's. It's only the only jobs it's going to take over in the next handful mm. of years. It's going to be people who aren't very good at those jobs to begin with and are just mm. doing the bare minimum. Is that why so, you're worried, Freddie? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, joking. even take. I mean, take most careers, and if you're just doing your basic mm. stuff, people on those base salaries, like on the ones that don't have much oversight that are just like, oh, here, check this list of stuff and get it done. Like, those are the kind of jobs that AI is going to be able to replace. Mm. Anything that requires, though, more like critical thinking or the human touch or creative ideas, anything like that, original mm. stuff, 
like AI can't replace that. Fast forward to 2050 and we'll... <laughs> Until we have something that is physically like on a human level of thinking, which is where we have this indifferent, not indifference, but mm. where AI is misrepresented and it's marketed mm. as this thing, but it's not truly AI. Yeah. I mean, as we, as we <laughs> said earlier, it's like the best way to use it is by, by using it as a tool and having a, like a, a lot of your own or a lot of human input and you, having a back and forth with it until you tweak the final result. And even then you'd want to take it out of whatever software and like put a final, um, final coat over it of, of uh, completely non AI um varnish over the top mm. so and that might change i mean it might get better and better but i think probably the, the tools will uh just evolve to make our lives easier or at least i That's hope the goal, really yeah i guess on that note should we talk about how we're actually using ai as a company now yeah terrible yeah. yeah sure emails um Yes, Freddie. Freddie's Freddie's emails. Emails. <laughs> Everybody knows all the emails coming from Freddy. All ChatGPT. Chat you know, you know, it's built into Spark now. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that's going to be dangerous. Not on it? your well, not on the not on the desktop just yet, but on the mobile apps. Um, oh. Spark is a email email uh, software yeah. email whatever it's called, um, and they've built in AI to like automatically generate G gmail has the same thing so if you just, if you okay, just press you backspace twice it pops up with a prompt does it yeah freddy's right, been uh, doing it actually. the old old-fashioned way i need to have a look Come at on, this. grandpa <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah Jack look GPT literally there you go there you go can we show yeah, the cameras up to the camera there you go say hello oh, to ai okay <laughs> um so yeah it, writing emails is one way how else are we using um i mean on my end um i mean i use yeah chat gpt most days um a lot of bard now as well and then um what's another one uh dolly you guys use any of that yeah it finishes for images um, yeah, yeah so i use that quite a lot for like thumbnails and just like blurred background images things like that mm -hmm. and also kind of just to get so you, ideas. you use it as an editing software as in you ask it to you say here's a photo can you blur the background in it no as or, in like the images i generate from it will tend to use just more as like a, a as not, a not a focal point yeah of something yeah because they're sense. not they're not perfect right they're not and then they're pretty yeah. cool yeah <laughs> it's a pretty crazy thing yeah there's obviously like there's one thing which is uh using it for text generate text generation and text based queries then there's images and then there's sound um there's uh obviously the text-to-speech thing that you used on the last podcast still i was my main use is is copy so mm -hmm. um just writing a lot of copy it's a bit training try and come up with yeah. it from scratch all the time so starting with a framework from ai is quite helpful and then mm -hmm. obviously going in and tweaking all that it's really good at coming up with it's actually really i'll say it's actually really bad at coming up with original caption ideas <laughs> and things like that like the actual copy on the captions kind of suck yeah and they're very repetitive and they're very just like nobody would actually say that yeah but it also like in saying a sense that copy is itself isn't that good but the idea is usually pretty good yeah and you know and what like, and the type right yeah well, and like the it. type of and the formatting that it uses mm -hmm. is like okay that's like a pretty good structure for a caption that general idea is pretty good now i'll just go write it how i would write it. yeah if that makes sense yeah with and and you know like i think this is a, this is a theme to a lot of what we're saying here today is like yeah it's good but it needs it needs tweaking it yeah needs like you still got input. to have your own input into it yeah. Mm. uh so i mean we've been mainly talking about uh, text uh, generation AI because we've been using a lot of that. I think that's Everyone what's has. been out the longest. Yeah. It's not been that long, but but we uh, for editing uh, there's uh, already a lot of cool kind of AI software like Runway AI, which is a kind of a background removal software AI. 
thing where you select your subject and it removes the background and it works really well. After Effects has a similar thing, but it's not as good as Runway uh, AI. Um, and um, have you been using that quite a lot in, in your yeah, yeah, I mean, I use the After Effects one a lot because yeah. um, the Runway you have to pay and we already have a subscription to, or I don't know if you have to pay. I don't know, it's just well, more if practical. It, if it's already integrated within After Effects. It's in my already workflow. in After Effects. It's like, rather than take the footage out to another yeah. like round trip and all that, it's just easier to do it within your... But it, wor it works so much better than After Effects. Um, so there's quite a lot of like AI programs for mm -hmm. copywriting, obviously, and that kind of thing, research. There's a handful of stuff out there with like image generation. Mm -hmm. um, Photoshop has the new uh, generative fill. Um, and that's quite powerful. Is there, as you've said, runway, but is there very much out there for video? As of yet, I feel like a lot of it's still in like a beta phase, a bit of trials, there's a lot of promise and talk, but there's not actually much that's super useful yet. Does that makes sense? Yeah, well, I think there's uh, that one where it cuts the clips. I can't remember what it was called that you saw on Instagram. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the actual software was. Yeah. Um, so there's one where you could like cut. So this podcast, for example, you just feed it three audio feeds, three video feeds. And it cuts and when it, it Yeah, when it picks up that I'm talking, it'll cut to my camera. And, yeah. but, and So like in a typical one hour podcast, if you have three feeds, you would manually go in there and you'd probably make two, 300 cuts. Yeah. By getting to different people and going through all that stuff. But this AI software is able to do it. Mm -hmm. and 15 seconds in a whole hour recognizes to who it recognizes yeah. who's talking and, and cuts the camera to them and and then presumably uh prevents it from like cutting back and forth like every three frames right um yeah i know anyway like yeah video editing capability i'm, I'm thinking of a lot of softwares and and stuff but they're just they're not ai um, right i don't think they're ai it seems like yeah. the, most of the stuff that is out is just stuff that's like is able to either replicate and improve and speed up the mm. like manual mm. tasks of things. It's not mm. actually really helping you with any of the creative work. It's like yeah. it's all very like black and white, if that makes sense. Any mm. like task within video editing, that's that's more black and white. Like mm. I need to sort this, mm. I need to cut this, 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 and mm. this. It can kind of take care of that. But it doesn't seem like it's very close to being able to do anything else yeah yet. but also like i feel like uh i don't know the, what do you need to be able to label it as ai like I, I i it's such a again it's such a buzzword right now that like someone who is developing this piece of software uh it would you know even without all this ai stuff it they would have being able to create this piece of software that does whatever it does. Right. Like, and they're like, oh, cool. There's like, I'll just slap on AI. I don't have enough technical knowledge about it to, to know where the line is in terms of, are they just using it as a marketing term yeah. or is it actually up. like machine learning and all the rest of it? Because how, how do you define artificial intelligence as well? You can, you know, depends how dumb the, the artificial thing is. <laughs> Depends how dumb the user is as well. Dumb the user is. Wow, this computer is intelligent. <laughs> so you could call a computer, yeah, just your Mac AI, <laughs> just because it, you know, it, it, I don't know, or like, um, is uh, Alexa AI? Oh, you said the word. Anyone, anyone listening to this? <laughs> speak, is that... Sorry, I'll rephrase that's, that. That's a really good like comparison there. I yeah. think what a lot of people are calling AI can AI can be compared to like what Alexa does and is. Mm -hmm. And Alexa's not an AI. It's like a virtual assistant and it's it's is not AI yet. And most of these things that we're talking about are not AI either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so with all of that, um, actually talk a little bit about Adobe's Firefly. So that's quite, that's probably like the biggest upcoming thing yeah. within video editing. Um, and what are you looking forward to about that? Uh, well, so I don't know how far we are from getting it. Um, how, how, cause they, they 
kind of announced it and talked about it and teased keep it. Keep teasing it. Keep teasing it. And I don't know, it might be five years or, I mean, if they're teasing it, it's <laughs> not that far ahead. But what it promises to do is pretty incredible. Um, so it has a version of generative fill for Premiere, uh, which it sounds really cool, but I can already see it having some pretty glitchy um kind of outcomes uh you know if you because like if you uh say there's a person here and you want to remove it and you say oh you remove the person but then it kind of like you know it's wavy wobbly kind of yeah, what bit does it wonky, replace a bit it wonky it? yeah was that what does it replace it by like what does it yeah i can i can see i mean for video it's a lot more difficult to um you know, photo is static, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you see what they've come out with with Photoshop and mm. like Lightroom, and you can get it to replace things within one static image. Yeah. But even within that, it's not always perfect. No. So, but to try to do that essentially for video mm. 24 times in a second yeah. for multiple seconds is a lot to ask on a piece uh, and, of software. And also have it fairly consistent between the frames. I think that's yeah, the, the, exactly. the biggest challenge is, first of all, you need to remove what you're asking it to remove, replace it by something that makes sense to replace it by and that looks fairly seamless. And then also exactly in the next frame, that. do yeah, exactly replicate mm -hmm. it 24, uh, 24 frames per second of video and also not have it sort of change dramatically yeah. within those because in a static image if you're just looking at one image you're like okay yeah that looks good but if it's moving and if there's like something flashing <laughs> yeah you know if if, if there's something I think, flashing i think it, adobe it. knows that as well and i think yeah. they know that when they put it out it's mm. got to be really good otherwise people aren't going to take it seriously mm. and if they actually do come up with something mm. people won't take it seriously the next time it comes out so i'm skeptical but we'll see yeah basically um it's exciting though yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of those videos where they, it's not necessarily, I don't know what they call it, um, but it's, yeah, there's a video of a DJ or something DJing and then they put like an AI fill on top and it's just. A, a filter. Yeah, like a filter. Yeah, it's like a filter, yeah. but it's like an AI filter and it, yeah. and it makes them, I don't like those at all because every frame it changes and it hurts my brain looking at it um so i don't like those um they're cool i mean i think with those in in terms of the content that we produce um i think it's a bit too late for that kind of stuff because it's so striking uh and like i think mm. that's what you were just talking about is like it well it you say it hurts your eyes but it's you know it, it's different it's it's striking and it's n very noticeable and i think mm. that's the issue that you probably have with it is how noticeable it is but mm. because it's so noticeable it's something that as soon as you've seen one or two of them it's a gimmick it's that's it like mm -hmm. you can't um you can't do it again it's like you remember the days when you used to take a picture and make everything black and white except the person's <laughs> coat like, that's yeah, really cool, cool. but yeah. then but then everyone started doing it and, and, now, it's and, it, cool. and now it's like oh it's, it's one of those things that gets outdated very quickly, yeah. like yeah. one or two photos. And then or it has to be like done so, so well and not many people do for a taxi stand out. Yeah. Or use yeah. it in, an, in a really creative, creative way. way. Yeah. yeah. Like, cause there is still, yeah, there's still scope to use it, but I think it needs to fit into the narrative of whatever video you're creating. Like if you have someone, mm -hmm. you know, if the narrative is someone who goes into a, some kind of fever dream, and then all of a sudden it makes sense to use that because mm. it's so disorientating and so different and, and whatever. Yeah. They used it for a Linkin Park video. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't like it. Okay. I just, I think it's just every frame. There's something new appearing. It's, it's just too much too, to process. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> is that maybe that's like our, you know, the future of attention span is every frame. <laughs> there has to be something different, different inside. <laughs> it's less and less by the day. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't like it. But anyway, uh, but after that, there's, um, the text to storyboard. Um, that's cool. Thing. That's something yeah. I, I'm excited about. That's going to use like AI imagery and yeah. stuff. And that's, that's when AI is, can be really useful is when it's behind the scenes stuff mm -hmm. rather than, um, so what is that? Can you explain what that is? Uh, so you, for those who don't know, you essentially, uh, 
if you want to create a storyboard, you type in your story yeah. in text, and then it takes that text and then makes a visual storyboard representation, yeah. representation of, of that uh, in a storyboard form. And that's going to be very cool. A huge time mm -hmm. saver for because you don't need to draw it anymore. Yeah. And, yeah. and a, a lot of people in this career field are not actually that like physically artistic. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. draw to save my life. Julian can. But Julian can. But yeah. I think it's actually quite rare. Yeah. Um, and ba most people, without being an actual storyboarder as a career field, like our storyboards are stick figures and like, oh, let's do this shot. Because like, we will hopefully have the ability now to much better represent yeah. our yeah. ideas and be able to show them. Yeah. To I clients. mean, I still, I still like to sketch my storyboards because, you know, I like drawing and that's kind of how I started and got into this career anyway. But there are limitations to it. So for example, I can draw stuff that I can see. I'm not, I can't draw, I, so I can replicate things that I can see because I can look at it and see what the different proportions are. Um, but I can't make something up. So I'm not like a really, like, I'm not like a cartoon artist who can like create something from scratch. Um, and that's why, you know, the other day I was asking you to like hold this thing in your hand and I took a photo of it for mm. reference and then, and then use it. And even like for some of them, I traced it as well. Um, but with uh, these, the artificial, the AI uh, image um, gener generating tools, you can ask it to create something from scratch. Um, so say like, you know, draw a hand holding a glass uh, or come up with a hand holding a glass and put a tree behind it. And then you use that as a frame for your storyboard. Mm. That's a bit still a bit slow because it takes a while for these images to to like generate something. Um, and usually, again, like needing human input, I take that image and then the tree might not be in a particular place behind the hand, but it's it would take ages to to get to to interact with the software to regenerate an image over and over again and get the tree in the right position. So I'll then you know, draw the hand and the glass and then just draw the tree, but a bit over to the left, for example. So that's how I use it for storyboarding right now. What else is there? There's a few other things that I'm less excited about. I mean, you can generate graphics now. It's like text graphics with AI and give it a look and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm less excited about uh, because I like to do that myself. Um, and I enjoy doing that bit, so it might be exciting for someone else. I mean, it'll be cool to see what it can do, but I'll probably still stick to making it myself because I enjoy the process um, and stuff like that. Um, I think that's about it. What uh, what kind of things would you guys like to see out of like future AI programs and stuff, software in the future? I'd like it to like just any menial task that is like repetitive and boring and annoying like if it could do my expenses for me that would be great <laughs> like i just feed it all the images of my receipts and it can like scan through them and and recognize like oh this is one from tesco and it's for this amount and on this date and then if it can match it up in our accounting software with uh it was spent here um and on this date and whatever and try and reconcile those receipts and then just feed me a list of things and I just click, okay, 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 okay. Or modify. Mm -hmm. That would that be would cool. Be so, you know, zero sure that's if you're, uh, if sure you're listening. <laughs> we kind of have it a bit with upscaling like footage. So mm -hmm. being able to take mm -hmm. either old footage or just like if a creator can't afford a big fancy camera and get regular camera that records in 1080p, but if it can actually like flawlessly upscale that to 4k without it looking fake yeah that would be really cool and um but like actively do that digital uh digital what, what's it called um sta digital image stabilization yeah like that's getting better and better it's yeah really good and if it can i've already been using uh kind of like image enhancers for um or uh, upscalers enhancers noise reduction that kind of stuff yeah but i was mainly about the image enhancer because it was a project i work on worked on for decanter tours mary darden um my mother um and it, it was a uh, motion design motion graphics uh piece and 
there were a lot of uh, historical photos and they were scanned. You know, you find them on Wiki Commons and they're free and uh, dusty and they're public domain. Not necessarily dusty, but they're really, they scan them, but they're super tiny. Yeah. yeah. They're like um, they were scanned in the 90s or something. Yeah, something like that. And they're, they're, they're minuscule. And I put it through an AI upscaler and uh, some work better than others, but I got it to, you know, a much larger size to a usable size that I can use in a 4K or 1080p video and animate it and uh, do stuff like that. So that's been really handy. That's really cool, actually. Yeah. Um, what, what do you don't want what to we see? Not want to see? I do. I can tell you one. All this deep fake stuff that scares me. The deep fake stuff. I feel like that's an, an inevitable byproduct of what we're going to get though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's something we're just going to have to catch ourselves up on. Because, in the same way that any technology is new, like people had no idea how to use the internet when it came out in the 90s. Like, we're in an era now that anything can be produced by anyone. Mm-hmm. And it can look like it came from anyone or be anyone. So we're now going to have to figure out how to protect our own identities in a more meaningful way. Like you're not just a social security number anymore. You're not just this or that. Like you will have a whole actual virtual persona that you need to protect and I guess differentiate between everyone else's because I actually don't even think it will be illegal in the future to be like, if someone wanted to copycat my actual being and use my voice, use my Mm -hmm. image and likeness, I think it's just going to be so commonplace because it's going to be so easy to do. It'll be impossible to stop it. Yeah, you can't, you're not going to be able to regulate that because I mean, especially like for us, for example, this podcast is probably enough to feed someone enough, enough samples of our voice and and angles of our face oh, absolutely. Um, for them to run it through software and then just take our faces and stick it on whatever video yeah. they want and make us do yeah. these horrible, horrible things. And mm. It'll yeah. be a learning curve for society though, because four or five years from now, I think people won't question, like people will not assume that if they see me on social media or whatever, that it's me. Mm. Like physically I did that. Mm. They'll be like, oh, that's, representation of me but there will be so much copying and representation of other people around that in the way now people are like oh we're we getting we get really faked out by that like a deep fake almost won't even exist because people will just assume that it wasn't you to begin with yeah but then they won't know that the real you is you either but coming out with the actual just real you will be the thing that we need to protect and like somehow be able to advocate they'll just have ai so fighting is, against and AI. that's just something we're gonna have to We'd need the way to actually yeah. like, if like no one trusts anything anymore, how do you verify what people should actually trust? Like even just for years, I'm not necessarily talking about br- the broader things like in the news and all that. How do you trust the news or whatever? But how, if you just want to put some something out on the internet and how do people know that you've actually created this and it's not just someone else? making you say something yeah and that's i don't think we have the things in place yet to verify that because the it's blue effort. instagram tick <laughs> is one thing <laughs> super useful kind of i mean mm. there will be need to be a lot more things like that i think mm. and i don't think i think people initially thought it was crazy to pay for something like that but i absolutely think everybody in the future will be paying for a piece of software or something that keeps your identity mm. verified mm. and keeps you you really because i would absolutely pay the 15 pounds a month whatever it is for a verified instagram page knowing that that page is has been actually verified by a large entity yeah and that that page is what it is it's genuine and that's what people are paying for people mm. aren't paying to like have a blue tick they're paying to not be represented misrepresented by anyone else i don't know i think a lot of people are just paying for the blue tick because they want to blue right tick right now yeah but that, that's not what it will be in the future is it like I twitter think it's, i think it's around those things.
this is a new thing like twitter uh instagram yeah. as in twitter is not new but the <laughs> <laughs> just, but yeah it's verified like Pay, the, paying for the verified right uh, you can do that interesting um yeah i think that pretty much wraps up the episode for today